Um, so the focus tonight is going to be on cell phone surveillance, particularly stingrays, um, which is a common name of this device that we're about to get into. We'll also be touching on other forms of surveillance that are affecting Houston and other Texas communities and growing number of communities around the country. We'll be talking um, with Rebecca from the EFF in Austin and with Tara from the ACLU here in Houston and talking about ways we can take action moving forward on these ideas. So. Hopefully everybody can see. Can everybody see or and hear me? So all this information is information that I've been gathering over the past uh, two years or so that I've been working as an activist and a freelance journalist researching this topic. We first heard about stingrays uh, a couple years ago and they've now got a lot more attention. And finally it's hit Houston and people are ready to listen. So I'm excited about that. Let's start off with... A quote here, this is from Tim Clemente, former FBI counterterrorism expert in May 2013 on CNN. He said, I'm talking about all digital communications. There is a way to look at digital communications in the past. I can't go into how it's done or what's done, but I can tell you that no digital communication is secure. This is one month before Edward Snowden started leaking his documents. Since 9-11, we know that the United States has increased funding for programs related to the war on terror internationally and also programs here at home uh, that have recently become center stage with the militarization of the police situations in Ferguson and um, what happened in Boston after the Boston bombing. People were surprised with the amount of military equipment that they had out there. This is coming from the Federal 1033 program where millions of dollars worth of military style equipment is being sent and given to local police departments including Houston and this is all due to the idea that we're fighting not only an international war on terror but the war on drugs and um, you know we're seeing an increase of this equipment being put to use. The fear of terrorism and again the fear of the drug war has allowed for most of us here to acquiesce and to give away bits and pieces of our privacy and to allow for constant surveillance. Um, a lot of the information that you're going to hear tonight is probably not going to be new to you for the most part. We all know that we're heavily surveyed. I think most people sort of accept it, but we're going to try to get you the details and see if we can, I believe, try to, to work to saving Americans' desire for privacy. Some people don't seem to think these things are a big deal, but hopefully we can change that. Some of the methods of surveillance include cell site simulators that we're going to talk about tonight, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, also known as drones, automatic license plate readers and public audio recording devices, sometimes known as shotgun recording devices that they put in the light poles supposedly to detect if there's a gunshot, if there's crime, but they're constantly recording. Cell phone monitoring, so that's going to be our focus tonight. 2013 study from the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project found that 91% of people, of adults in the United States, use cell phones, so obviously that's a great target if you're trying to gather information on what people are doing, what they're talking about, and and where they're at. Mm, cell site stimulators, aka Stingray. According to the EFF, the Stingray is a brand name of an IMSI, International Mobile Subscriber Identity, which all phones have. It's just like an identifying number that they can use to find your phone. So it's an IMSI catcher targeted and sold to law enforcement. It works by masquerading as a cell phone tower. So it tricks your phone into thinking that it's a cell phone tower as your phone's signaling out the signal every 7 to 15 seconds, whether you're calling or not, just being on right now, it's sending out a signal, so um, it tricks your phone into thinking it's a tower and can give the police a, and the ability to triangulate your location to find you and then to use that to gather data from uh, your phone. They can figure out who, when, and where you are calling, the precise location of every device that's within range, and with some devices they can even capture the content of your conversation. Some of the newer ones, the uh, more advanced models, can actually gather what you're talking about. <laughs> this is one of the ways that they work, triangulation, which to me is funny. I think a lot of people have heard this idea in Hollywood movies and thought it was just some sort of Hollywood spy thing, but they can, they can triangulate your location. Um, this, this shows an example of that. The, the stingrays can be implanted into vehicles, like it shows here in the van, or it can be a mobile device where some, some of the court cases show them literally walking around door to door with this device, gathering information and data on people. Um, so law enforcement are looking for someone, they send out a signal there, they can use that to uh, 
basically like measure your signal strength. You know, the stronger the signal, obviously, the closer they are to you. So they're sending out the signal trying to locate somebody or an individual. And they go around, but the problem is when they're doing that, they're also gathering everyone's information indiscriminately. You know, so even if we're going to buy the premise that this is uh, law enforcement going after criminals who, you know, violent criminals or whatever that they need to, they need to locate, when they're out there using this device, they're not targeting one specific person. Every single one of us here who have been in the range of that device um, have had our information gathered. And there's at this point, there's you know, there's some issues with how long they keep that information, who has it, what it's being used for. So a little bit of history of the stingrays. This technology has existed since at least the 1990s and probably much earlier than that. Um, they were first started to be reported on in 2011 related to a California drug case. And this seems to be the situation that keeps happening is basically they use them to get people to catch them for drug crimes or whatever it is. They use the stingrays, but they don't want to talk about how, how they use them, how they gather the information. So sometimes the cases will actually get thrown out of court. They're manufactured in the United States by Harris Corporation out of Florida. They've been making them since 2002. There are other names. The Stingray is just the most common one that's been reported, but there's also the Stingray 2, Amberjack, Kingfish, Triggerfish, Loggerhead. They tend to have these sea, ocean based names. There's also another device that Houston has that's called the Harpoon, which is like an additional device that allows the range of, the, of it to be increased. So with the Harpoon and the Stingfish, they can gather much more information. Uh, this was further exposed in the summer of 2013 by whistleblower Edward Snowden, and a lot of his documents have been sort of connected to these programs. Uh, and it received attention in 2014. This has just been growing. I've been watching it. I have a feed of just Stingray cell site simulator news. I watch it every day, and I've just been seeing the amount of information that's starting to increase. Uh, Baltimore, uh, there's been a recent thing in Chicago. I mean, there's starting to get the attention that it deserves, and that is coming to Houston, of course. So what's the problem with cell site simulators? I kind of mentioned a few of them. The first problem is they don't require a warrant. Um, at least yes. not, you know, there's no, there's no hard and fast rule about this because this is a new frontier of technology and we know the police are using them. They're not asking what they can and can't do with them. They're just doing it, you know. So in some states there have been, here in Texas, for example, a judge said that, a San Antonio judge said that there is no uh, need for a warrant, that it doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. Other, uh, Washington, I think recently, a judge, she actually asked for, set a, a new rule that they'd have to ask for specific permission to use stingrays, you know, so they're going to use stingrays, they can't just say surveillance device, they have to tell her, okay, we're going to use a stingray, or they're going to have to tell her exactly what they're going for, so she's trying to make it more targeted. So, that's one of the issues. There's a patchwork of, uh, of laws, if there's any that even exist right now, and the cops can indiscriminately, as I said, they used them in one case walking in an apartment complex looking for somebody. No, oh, no, not here, not here, not here. And they're gathering everybody's information along the way, you know. Um, so that's one of the problems. Also, Harris Corps, Corps non disclosure agreements are a huge problem. So they partner with local police departments, federal agencies. They sell them these devices, the stingfish, stingrays. And as part of that deal, they're bound to non-disclosure agreements that they can't tell anyone how it works, what they do with them, you know, what type they have, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this even applies in court. Two weeks ago, there was a court case in Baltimore. As I said, there's been an ongoing situation. Same thing, they're trying to, the cops are trying to send somebody to prison for drug charges. Um, they got the information, they found out where this guy was and you know, caught him with drugs by using a stingray or some type of cell site simulator. They didn't even say. So they take him to court. The judge is ready to sentence the guy that put the cop on the witness stand and she asks them how they went about doing this. He says surveillance equipment. She asked him for more information. She got stingray out of him, but he wouldn't give any more information beyond that. She told him she would hold him in contempt if he didn't answer, and he still refused to answer. Instead, the prosecutors decided to withdraw the, the evidence and just drop the case rather than give up information about how these things are being used. So that's, you know, that's obviously a problem that if this corporation can make the police department sign a, a, an agreement that is making them go against the courts and uh, violate the law. And as I said, indiscriminate surveillance, these, uh, these devices, they're not targeted. And there's a quote there I put from the EFF, the stingrays are an unconstitutional all-you-can-eat data buffet. So a little more details that I've gathered. Most of this stuff right here on this next list, um, in Florida, there was a Supreme Court case, actually the Stingrays made it to the Florida Supreme Court and a judge forced some transcripts to be released from a case that dealt heavily with Stingrays, and so a lot of information came out of that. One of the things is, as long as your phone is on, the Stingray can find you. So the only thing you can do is turn it off. 
people talk about taking out the battery, stuff like that. You do not have to be making or receiving a call for you to be trapped. It just has to be on. And this was an interesting uh, little tidbit that came out of that court case. The Stingrays force cell phones to send data to the device at a full signal so that consumes batteries faster. So if you're a journalist, an activist, or somebody who just regularly you go to protest or whatever, and you deal with police, and for whatever reason your brand new iPhone just keeps dying and you can't figure out why that battery keeps dying, that could be a sign that you're being tracked by a Stingray. Stingrays, as I said, they could be handheld, they could be vehicle based. Um, officers are more than likely, and I'd say 100%, are bringing these to large protests to gather, gather data about people in attendance. This has been shown like through other court cases. So when the cops are there, whatever protest you're at, you have one of them sitting in the car, he might be sitting there in the Stingray just like gathering, gathering everybody's information. Um, the next thing that's coming out is body-worn IMSI catchers, so they'll be able to walk through a crowd of people wearing this device and gather up a bunch of information. And they're already being used on planes. Some of you guys may have seen the story a couple of weeks ago. The Wall Street Journal broke the story that there are at least six airports where the federal government or agencies within the federal government are using uh, Cessna planes with Stingray, what they call their, their version of cell site simulators. They're called dirt boxes. It's like the nickname, DRT boxes. They call them dirt boxes. So they're flying overhead and gathering tens and thousands of people's information at a single time. So we've got them in the cars. We've got them handheld. We've got them... In the planes, we have the, soon for them the ability to wear them. So who's using these? This is the important part. The technology has so far made it into the hands of at least 47 agencies in 19 states, and I'm sure the numbers are high, higher than that. This comes from ACLU data and other, others out there, but like I said, we don't really know who has what yet because they're not really volunteering their information. They're not telling them, hey, we're using this toy. It just sort of, people start hearing about it or it comes up in court. At least 12 federal agencies are known to use these devices as well. And here's a map that was put together by the ACLU that shows the various states that are um, using it. It's kind of hard to see the different colors, but Texas is red, which is, a, which is state and local police have cell site simulators. Um, so you see most of the states here in the gray, these are unknown, but we can pretty much assume that they have them. This one is that they have the cell site simulators, they have them, so local police, state police, and federal police. Texas has them, Houston, the DPS, other cities, police departments. And now some folks on Houston. So Houston, the Houston Police Department has been using these since at least 2007, or that's when the, the contracts first began. They got additional funding in 2011. And they were reauthorized last in 2012. Some of you may have seen or heard that. Helena Brown, former councilwoman, was the only person to vote against that. And they, they upgraded, when they did that, they upgraded to the Stingray 2, which basically, as cellular networks are evolving, we go for more people are on the 3G and going even beyond that. Most of the cell site simulators have been acting on the 2G network. So this Stingray 2 is them getting an upgrade to come to the new, um, the new frontier of cell phones. And all that good stuff. So this was first acknowledged in September 2014, and of course this past month it started to make national news with local coverage, and then Truthout actually put out all the, the transcripts, the, the contracts that the city of Houston has with Harris Court. And the HPD Chief of Police, Charles McClellan, and several Harris County judges that have been interviewed and in stories uh, related to this have refused to answer any questions about this. Um, and in September, as I said earlier, a San Antonio judge ruled no warrant needed, no reasonable expectation of privacy. I thought that was really interesting because she basically said that since you're using your cell phone with a third party, that there's no, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy that somebody else can't access that information and that you should be protected in any way, no matter how they get it. Uh, which seems a little bit unconstitutional or odd. I threw this one in there. This is the actual contract right there. You can see our mayor down there signing it. Over the top it says maintenance, Stingray 2. This is the bottom page of it. And that was in October 2012. What's the cost here? Um, let me go back. Yeah, well, I know that um, I saw earlier that they, they spent over $5 million on surveillance equipment in general, but I don't know how much. What does it say there? 100000 right there. For it. So in 2012, it was 100000 That was, I guess, the last uh, upgrade. That's amazing. <laughs> So this, I threw this quote in, this is from the Texas Civil Rights Project. This is a little bit, this is, we're going to kind of broaden here and talk about other forms of surveillance uh, for a second. 
and this is related to that. The Texas Civil Rights Project in January 2014, after the city installed 180 new cameras downtown, bringing the number of cameras installed downtown close to 1,000. If you did not know, the HP operates a 24-hour manned uh, CCTV station where you know they're connected to all these cameras and various things. Um, and after they did that, the Texas Civil Rights Project said, we need to start a serious dialogue about the level of government intrusion in our daily lives that government foists upon us without our consent. Recently, the ACLU of California put out this guide, and all this information I'm talking about, I have, like, if anybody wants further details, I've got all this stuff, we can talk about it further. But they put out this guide, Making Smart Decisions About Surveillance, and of course it's tailored towards California, but a lot of the information there is really good just for communities in general. So I definitely recommend downloading this PDF and having to look through it. Some of the stuff they talk about are, as I said, drones, UAVs, automatic license plate readers, public audio recording devices, CCTV surveillance, which is what that HP station is, facial recognition, and automated social media monitoring, monitoring which is just program, you know, uh, programs that are set up to just search social media, all kinds of things, activists, look for keywords, analyze it, store it. And this is another problem with the Stingray is we don't really know what's happening with this information, where it's going, how long they're keeping it, there are no hard and fast rules yet, and there's also only so much that we can do on the technological side as far as like trying to combat it. Um, but that's what this last slide here is about. What can we do? First of all, we know knowledge is power, so that's why we're holding this. Like I said, I've been watching this for a while. I know others in here have heard the name Stingrays and heard about these things. Us coming together, this hopefully is the beginning of Houston really starting uh, some type of coalition or movement against surveillance and really waking people up to the importance of our privacy. So we need to educate our friends and family. As I said, we're streaming right now. I'll be videotaping this and putting it out there. I'm going to put this uh, PowerPoint presentation for anybody to take and share with whoever, put wherever uh, we need to get this information out there. Um, I also, some of you saw the Channel 2 story that ran a couple weeks ago, which is one of the reasons we're here. That guy, Jace Larson from KP, KPRC, I've been texting him, and he's going to do a follow-up story to this. He just couldn't make it tonight, but he's definitely, he definitely wants to stay up with this, and I told him he should make sure to let people know that there are people who are getting active on the issue, so he'll be doing that soon. Uh, if you want to get involved in other ways, that's, that's what they're going to really hit on, but you can lobby city council and the state legislature for information, uh, getting limits on data collection and warrant requirements. Also, you can support technologies that counter the surveillance, and that includes IMSI ca capture detectors, and there's one of those that I know of that is currently available that is in beta testing mode. Basically, for those who want to look more on that side, that's something that I'm personally interested in. Just search that term, IMSI catcher detector, and there's only one out there. It's basically some guys, some tech-savvy people are trying to find uh, a way to have an app or something on your phone that would not only tell you if you were being hit with a stingray, but would have some way to prevent it. Right now, I, I've talked to a couple of more tech-savvy people who told me some ways to go about First, being able to locate all the cell towers that's in your area, and then uh, a roundabout way to be able to locate, like, okay, yeah, I'm being monitored, but no way to stop it other than turning your phone off, but you would still be able to recognize it. So there are things like that that we could talk further about. And of course, the other solution, which none of us are going to do, is stop using our cell phones. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is my cell phone. This is my dumb phone. <laughs> but this is the thing, see, I use this because I just don't really like smartphones, I've never owned one, and I know that they're much more traceable, but at the same time, like, see, a Stingray, it doesn't matter, it's got a signal, they can get it, you know, so that's the thing, is how, no matter how old the phone you get, like, if, you, if it's putting out a signal, they can find it. Um, does it make a difference, because, uh, I've heard that it made a difference to get the internet connection on your phone? So if you have just kind of a simple phone without any internet connection, does that protect you from any of this? Not from a Stingray, because as long as your cell phone is transmitting that signal to a cell tower, then they can come in and be the, uh, it's like called man in the middle, like they can come in there and, and trick your cell phone. Yeah, essentially it's looking for two numbers, it's looking for your number that's hard coded to your phone and, and, your, and your SIM card number. And, and between those two numbers, they can pretty well keep track of anything. And again, if they're so, let's think about this for a second. Um, if if they're tracing your phone now, if, say you were under suspicion for whatever, or, I mean, these days a lot of us, we hear the story is that you don't really have to be a crazy criminal to be under surveillance. You know, you can just be a regular activist or somebody that just cares. There's a lot of weird things that get people under uh, monitor. But if this device could create a profile of where you go when you wake up, like who you make calls to, how long those calls are, you know, and things like that. And if you do that to somebody, you can create a profile of their life and the people they're connected to. And you know that, that can get to some pretty scary territory. So we need to try to get on top of these things before they spread any further because as we can see that this surveillance state isn't going to go anywhere.